church. It's good to see you guys. I'm not going to try and even climb up the stairs this morning. So um, it is so nice to see all of you. I just wanted to welcome every one of you here today. So glad you guys could make it. Um, We are talking about a pretty heavy subject today. So I'm just going to open us up in prayer just so we can just get our minds ready to receive it um, because it is it's going to be pretty intense. Um, So yeah, so if you guys just want to pray with me, that'd be great. Jesus, um, thank you so much for this amazing space that we get to come together today. Thank you for the amazing worship, and we just get to praise you. Um, just, I just pray that we just lay at your feet today with hands open, hands open to whatever you need to show us today. Um, I just want to lift up all the people in this, in this place, um, the people that have been just hurt in their marriage, people that are struggling in their marriage. Um, Also, I just want to praise you for the marriages in this church. Um, And just, I just want to lift up people who just are, just don't know where to go, who are lost, are just confused about everything in life. Um, If they have questions, that we just lay it all at your feet, Jesus, and We just come to you today and say, what do you got for us? Spirit, just move inside of us. Just lift us up, please. We just ask that you just fill us and just overflow from us. Any distractions, 
anything that we're holding, holding on to, I just pray that we just lay it down and the distractions are just left out the door so we can just focus on you today, Lord. If there's anything that we are just holding against another person, I just ask that we can just lay it down at your feet and just give it to you. You've already won this battle. The battle is won. All glory to you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope with no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. Ash was redeemed, only beauty Yes, we're free, free 
can have a seat before you do. Go ahead and just greet someone you haven't greeted yet this morning. Give them some love. Oh man, it is so good to be in a space with all of you uh, to worship Jesus this morning, to worship our King. Hey, we are uh, in the midst of the Sermon uh, on the Mount, and it's going to look a little bit different this morning. Um, usually I give uh, you know, a description, uh, a summary, a reminder of kind of where we've come from in the previous week's teaching. My goal is to provide an accurate context, a lens 
uh, of how to read and, and how to understand and wrestle with some of the things that Jesus is saying in this context to the people he's saying it to and prophetically through to us today. Um, but this subject, uh, I think, just kind of demands a bit more uh, of my time uh, this morning trying to communicate. Uh, we're at the part of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus addresses marriage and divorce. Marriage and divorce. Uh, and today, um, there's about 50% of all marriages um, that experience divorce. And so, just statistically speaking, all of us have been impacted by it. Maybe directly or indirectly, or we've had friends that have been heavily affected by it. Um, this is a sensitive subject. And so, I just before we dive into it, I just want to say a few things. At first, I'm an imperfect person attempting and trying to trust the Holy Spirit to communicate God's perfect truth and grace. Okay, so there's going to be things I'm just, I'm not going to probably clarify to the extent that maybe some of you wish um, or, or, or desire. I'm an imperfect person trying to communicate a, a, the heart of a perfect God. And the other thing I want to say is that this subject of marriage and divorce is much bigger than a singular message. Okay, this demands like a sermon series. Um, this demands much more, right? So there's just going to be stuff I'm not going to get to. Uh, this morning, and uh, for the sake of time, we do have some football to watch. I'm just teasing with you guys, but, um, you know, maybe this is a subject where one of, the, one of these Sundays, we break for lunch, we come back here, we break for dinner, and just like Paul, when Paul preached all night until that boy fell asleep and died, and he just, like, lifted him up from death, like, maybe we do that, right? Come on, right? <laughs> um, but there's just going to be stuff I'm not going to get to for the sake of time. Uh, the, the other thing I want to say concerning the subject of marriage and divorce is that this isn't something that we can just neatly, cleanly, intellectually compartmentalize. This subject involves people, like, like, like real people with real souls that are processing emotions and hurts, wounds, and pain. And lastly, just to remind all of you that this is a place and we are a people that speak the truth in love. That we are so quick to give mercy and grace because we're the first ones to know we need it ourselves. And even if we haven't gotten a divorce, every single one of us has a strained or damaged relationship in our lives. So before we pick up a stone, we need to know and go to the one who is truth, who is grace. With that being said, we're going to jump into just two verses. Jesus doesn't expound here in the Sermon on the Mount much of his thought and heart behind divorce. He hits it very precisely. But what we're going to do is after we talk about these two verses, we're going to jump to Matthew 19. Because in that context, he actually has a conversation about marriage and divorce. So we're going to jump there this morning. Before we do, let's, let's tackle what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 31 through 32. Jesus said, It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. I'm going to read the message version of this. I just think that some, sometimes how the message phrases things, it kind of helps us understand a bit more of the context. So the message version says this, remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights. Too many of you are using that as a cover for selfishness and whim pretending to be righteous just because you're legal. Please, no more pretending. If you divorce your wife, you're responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she has already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. I think that splashes a bit more of context of what Jesus is communicating here. But for even more, we're going to jump now to Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 3. 
At this point, Jesus and his boys, Jesus and his friends, his disciples, they're, they're traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem, and they're in the region in the area of Judea. And in verse 3, we pick up this, this passage. It says, And the Pharisees came to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause or for any reason? Now, I'm going to stop right there. This was a heated and controversial question. Okay, there's a couple reasons why. The first is that Jesus is in Judea. He's in Judea. Under the jurisdiction of Herod Antipas. And it was John the Baptist that just confronted Herod Antipas not to divorce his wife and marry and chase after his brother's wife. It's unlawful. You can't do that. And Herod Antipas was so mad he threw John in prison, confronting, John, confronting him of his divorce. Now later, from an overextended, overstated promise, Herod Antipas actually had John the Baptist beheaded. So here, even in the region, right, this is super sensitive content. This is controversial. This is heated. But more than that, the Pharisees are referring to a highly debated Jewish divorce law. A, a, a highly debated Jewish divorce law with an ambiguous, uh, sorry, with an uh, ambiguous for any reason or for any cause clause that made that divorce legal. Okay, so there was a divorce law, and it had a certain, like, unique, ambiguous phrase that said, for any reason, for any, for any cause, you can divorce your wife. And it was so ambiguous, it was so generalized, it was so unclear, like, what is that reason that there was a heated debate behind that? There were two schools of thought. There were two camps to the debate. One camp was in the corner of Rabbi Shammai. It was in his corner. Rabbi Shammai said that this, this indecency found in a woman is only having to do with sexual immorality. Rabbi Hillel is the other rabbi, and his interpretation of that ambiguous statement for any cause was that this indecency this any cause could be anything that made this husband unhappy. Okay, all of this stems back from Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. Uh, in the Good News translation, it says, suppose a man marries a woman and later decides that he doesn't want her because he finds something about her that he doesn't like. So he writes out divorce papers, gives them to her, and sends her from his house. So that... Something that they don't like, that for any reason or any cause, that, that some ambiguous indecency, it was either purely sexual immorality or it could just be anything that made the husband unhappy. Guess what side Israel sided with? Rabbi Hillel. Anything that made the husband unhappy. Divorce, in this context, was rampant. Divorce was all over the place. Men abused this patriarchal system and design that God had created. Men were uncommitted. Men were not loyal. And women were at a disadvantage. Men could file a divorce. Women could not. Men were abusing the system. Women were vulnerable and at a disadvantage. This was the climate of the day. This was the strain of the day when it came to marriage. Jesus responds in verses 4 through 6. He says this. Have you not read? Like, oh, this is to the scribes and Pharisees, right? Like experts that read the law, experts that interpret the law. Jesus is saying, have you not read? Like, I love that. He's like, do you even read your Bible? <laughs> have you not read? That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. Other translations say to cling to his wife. 
and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. See, it's interesting because the Pharisees go back to, De- to Deuteronomy. Jesus goes back to Genesis. The Pharisees go back to the law. Jesus goes back to creation. The Pharisees go back to damage control, but Jesus goes back to the original design. Jesus is saying, do you read your Bibles? Marital union between a man and a woman represents and symbolizes God's union within himself and God's union with humanity. This is a powerful symbol, a powerful representation. This is how you represent God, Yahweh, and his kingdom. God created marriage for two to become one. For the man to come alongside, to care for, and to even cling to his wife. For a couple to enter into an inseparable bond. Jesus is saying, so why are you looking for cheap ways to separate that bond? The Pharisees have a rebuttal. They say in verses 7 through 9, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. And from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Jesus clarifies that divorce isn't a commandment like go and do. Divorce isn't a commandment, it's a concession to their hard hearts. That due to a fallen world with frail human beings, God allowed divorce to accommodate broken humanity. But from the beginning, it was not so. Though divorce is allowed, it was never a part of God's original plan. And Jesus is clearly holding the Pharisees not accountable to the law, but accountable to creation, the original plan and design for marriage. Not only is he holding the Pharisees accountable to the original design, but Jesus, he adds into the conversation. He gives his interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 1. And he says this as his interpretation. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Jesus is siding and agreeing with Rabbi Shammai. Jesus is saying, no, no, that's the proper interpretation for, the, for any reason or for, the, for any cause clause in that Jewish divorce instruction. It's sexual immorality. Now, I'm going to rabbit trail for just a little bit, and I promise I'm going I'm to weave right back into this flow of thought because there's a reason Jesus said only sexual immorality in this, in this context, in this conversation. There's a reason. I'm going to flow a little bit out, and I'm going to flow right back in. There are two other strong biblical cases for divorce that I read in Scripture. These are my thoughts, okay? The two I see in Scripture are abuse and abandonment. Abuse, abandonment. Okay, abuse, all the way back to Exodus 21, verses 10 through 11, When polygamy was practiced, right, again, the Israelites just came from Egypt, 400 years of slavery, Um, the influences and the practices of the pagan cultures infiltrated their minds and in their hearts and in their practices. So Israel was practicing polygamy. God met them where they were at and just tried to meet them where they're at and guiding them forward with a proper heart in mind. And so while polygamy was being practiced and as a man took a second wife, Exodus 21, verses 10 through 11, God says to these uh, men who takes on a, a second wife to not neglect the first wife, okay? The first wife was actually permitted to leave her husband if he didn't clothe her, feed her, or make love to her. 
okay? So it's like, okay, um, we're going to get to the polygamy part. We're going to get there. Uh, but, but first, if you want to take a second wife, you have to continue to love your wife from your youth. You can't neglect her. You have to continue to love her. And in my mind, purposefully with food, clothing, and intimacy is a form of abuse. The woman was free to leave if that abuse took place. It was clearly instructed. That, that's an example. Another example is Malachi 2, and specifically in verse 16, it says, The Lord God of Israel says he hates divorce, along with the one who conceals his violence by outward appearances, says the Lord of the heavenly army. So guard yourselves carefully and don't be unfaithful. God, through Malachi, is making this interesting connection between divorce and one who is violent, though on the outside appears lovely. How many marriages on the outside appear strong, but in the home there's violence, there's manipulation, there's abuse. And certain spouses fear for their lives. God says, I, I hate that. That breaks my heart. The other biblical case that I see for divorce is abandonment. And this is actually in the New Testament. Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that when two people come together, they're married, and then one comes to faith. They were like, Paul, what do we do? And Paul says, hey, because you've come to faith, but your, your, your spouse is still an unbeliever, stay in the context that you're in. Like whether you're free or whether you're a slave, whether you're married or, or single, stay in the context you're in to where God has called you. And, and be a holy influence. Bring a heavenly influence to where you're at. And so he was commanding, and, well, not really commanding, instructing, encouraging these, these married couples, one being a believer, one not being a believer. He says, hey, if, if you find yourself in faith and in that situation, stick with it. You can bring holiness to that marriage. You can bring holiness to your kids, to that home. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, Paul says, if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. If the unbeliever leaves, you're not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. So those are two biblical cases that I see, but there is a reason that Jesus only states sexual immorality in this context and conversation. It's easy for humanity, it's easy for us humans to look for the exception to the rule. And even in me communicating these two strong biblical cases for divorce, what was pressing on my heart to communicate is that I do not want to communicate room or room to get out of or room to decommit. Because that is so the human nature. I'll commit, but to be one foot in and one foot out. And that is exactly why Jesus only states sexual immorality in this conversation. It's because people were looking for the exception to the rule. There's three reasons why Jesus stated sexual morality in relation to covenant marriage. The first is that sex is the consummating act that begins a marriage covenant. It begins a marriage covenant. So sex outside of the marriage with someone else symbolically breaks and, and comes to an end in that covenant and begins an unlawful union with someone else. If you have sex with someone else outside of your marriage, you are breaking and ending that covenant marriage and wanting to begin some unlawful union with someone else. So when someone files for divorce in this context and conversation, the divorce isn't in the marriage. It ended when there was sexual morality. That's how powerful sex is. In a culture here and today where sex is free and maybe with just little consequence, the original design for sex was so powerful, beginning a union to becoming one. So if you're unfaithful to that union with that act, with that act you were actually ending the union with that act. That's why Jesus states sexual morality. The second reason he did that is that he was purposefully protecting 
vulnerable, defenseless, and powerless women who were at risk of getting a divorce for any cause. Jesus whittles it down to the breaking of the covenant in order to protect women because they could make a bad breakfast and get divorced. They could set aside the wrong clothes and get divorced. They could not greet their husbands and get a divorce. If they weren't sexually satisfying and, and pleasing their husbands away and the demand of and from the husbands, they get a divorce. It's interesting how it has echoed 2,000 years later. He whittled it down to the breaking of union covenant to protect women. And to the flip of that coin, Jesus whittles it down to one exception, the breaking of union, to challenge men and to call men to step up. He was calling men to step up. He was calling men to lead and to love, to serve, and to sacrifice for their wives. This, was, this is what covenant behavior and covenant relationship looks like. Jesus was saying to these guys, fight for your marriage. Invest in your marriage. And it's interesting that in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives practical steps on how to fight for a marriage. And a few verses prior to him communicating and, and expounding on divorce, Jesus says, hey guys, fight for your marriage. Check your heart. Because in your heart you might have some hate. And hate is the spirit of murder. Just because your spouse doesn't love you in that way or treats you in that way or does this or that in these certain aspects and in these certain facets, just because he does something to upset you, check your heart and go to God to heal you and rid you of anger. Because anger can release some Gehenna in your marriage. It can destroy your marriage. So check your heart. And then the following verses, Jesus says, hey men, Check your heart for lust, too. Because sometimes with your selfish expectations held over your wife, and she upsets you, you want to go to someone else for satisfaction. You want to go to someone else to please you. You want to go to someone else or some other source to, to, to try to comfort you. you got to check your heart for lust, my brothers. Jesus was protecting women in challenging men to have a healthy union and bond. And if we allow the healing power of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, to check our hearts in these ways, divorce isn't even an option. <laughs> and that's why he states, unless there's an ending of that covenant through sexual morality. Paul echoes this in Ephesians. He says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, as to the Lord, as to the Lord. Husbands, pursue the Lord. Pursue the Lord. Because she's, in a, she's called to submit to you as to the Lord. So husbands, you better be pursuing the Lord. Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And how many times does a man shut the book right there? Uh, the Bible says, submit to me. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. As Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. If we stop the conversation at wives submit to your husband, you have to continue the conversation and this passage because men you have the greater submission. Sacrificing your life for your wife. That he might sanctify her. Jesus having 
cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. Jesus foundationally affirms and restores the design of marriage and is himself the cause, the source to bring about healthy, God-honoring marriages because in him we are being formed by his powerful, pure, selfless, sacrificial, lamb-like love. And though the design of marriage is from God and is good, though God looked at Adam and Adam did not have a wife, and God's like, ooh, he needs a woman in his life. <laughs> it's not good that this boy's alone. Though marriage is from God and is good, it is sin in our participation in it that brings deceit distortion and damage to God's good design. Sin brings brokenness into God's beautiful creation. I want to address this brokenness. I want to say first to us as the church, and then I'll address maybe some specific people that Holy Spirit knows who you are. But addressing brokenness, this type of unique brokenness of divorce, I got to communicate this to you, church, and to me. We are called to be salt, a preserving and healing agent. We are called to be light, a beacon of hope and healing. We are called to be a safe haven, a people of restoration. We're called to be a hospital, bringing people, bringing the sick to the physician. I say this because divorced men and women in the church community have been tragically looked down upon. They have been marginalized, ostracized, and in some churches, excommunicated. And regardless if you think that because of their divorce, that man is now an adulterer and that woman is an adulteress, do you recall Jesus' interaction with the adulterous woman? As Jesus was teaching in the temple, the Pharisees caught a woman in the act of adultery and laid her at his feet and said that Moses says that such women deserve to be stoned. What do you say? Jesus bends down and starts writing something in the sand. In verse 7 of John 8, it says, As they continued to ask him, Jesus stood up and said to them, All right, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Now go and leave this sin. Or go and from now on sin no more. Jesus did not accuse this woman. He did not sentence this woman. He acknowledged this woman's sin that was bringing Gehenna to her life, was bringing devastation and destruction to her life. And he meets her with grace. As he says truth, saying, leave this behind you. This is hurting you, honey. Follow me. Choose life. Don't choose this sin. It is bringing your own death upon your head. Leave it. Could come with me. He did not bound this woman to the law because Jesus was binding himself to the law because he is the fulfiller of the law. 
he did what this woman couldn't do and what we all couldn't do. And he lived in perfect obedience, becoming our righteousness. So we are called to be like Jesus in this scenario and with divorced men and women, even in the church community. We do not pick up our stones. We drop them because we are not without sin. Or do you recall Jesus' interaction with the woman at the well? This woman had five divorces, and the man that she was with was her live-in boyfriend. And Jesus doesn't condemn her. He exposes her reality and leads her to a better way as he's leading her to himself, saying, I am the Christ. She runs from Jesus to the town and says, come meet a man that told me everything about me. Jesus only said this, but she knew she was fully known and fully loved. The beautiful thing about Jesus is that sinners, prostitutes, divorced men and women, notorious sinners, they felt comfortable around Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was constantly bringing them out of false identity into true identity. This is not who you are. You were made for more than this. I redeem you to be more than this. Come follow me, I'll show you a better way to be human, a better way to be a true human. You're settling for less. Let me give you more. They felt so free, so loved, so accepted. My challenge for us as Laurel Church, if someone walks into this room, this space, and they've been divorced five times, are we going to love them and say, hey, come drink from the water of life? And lastly, I just want to address the brokenness of some of the individuals in this space. For some of you listening online, for some of you who will listen to this later. I just had in my heart to say two things to you. If this has been a direct devastation and brokenness in your life. You have a redeemer. You have a healer. And his name is Jesus. Uh, in, in the Greek, in the New Testament, when we read the word redemption, it literally means this. Buying back from. Repurchasing what was previously forfeited or lost. <laughs> if you're a human being... You were made to belong to God. And Jesus came to show us that. And he came to take the debt of sin and to break the power of sin. To pay the ransoming price, which was his own life, death, and resurrection. In order to restore us back to God and back to our rightful place as his children. You have a redeemer. And there is no mistake. Can someone give me a tissue? I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm literally about to go. Like. Uh. Sandy, I think this is your spiritual gift. This is not the first time. That right there was not good for, pro for COVID protocols, by the way. <laughs> hey, stop, Grady, stop recording. Stop. <laughs> you have a redeemer. There is no mistake, no brokenness, no sin, no ugly divorce that can ever have a bigger price than the precious price of the blood of Christ. You have a redeemer, which means you have a new name and a new status. You are not, fill in the blank, the divorced. You are, fill in the blank, the beloved. And for those of you 
your parents got a divorce. That wrecks you up. But you have a redeemer. You are not a child of divorce. You are a child of God. You have a redeemer. This is our story. How once was lost, but I'm found. How once was broken, but I'm whole and I'm experiencing this healing. This did happen to me, but I know what traces far back beyond that point and what had happened to Christ and has happened now to me. He has set me free. This is who I am. You have a redeemer. And Psalm 107 verse 2 says, let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. If this has been a direct brokenness in your life, you have a chance to tell the story of God, the story of redemption. This is who I was. Maybe this is who society still sees me as. But I know who I truly am because my God has set me free. And lastly, you have a healer. Jesus doesn't just heal you from a distance. He's like the father of the prodigal who comes running up in your pig poop and gives you a massive hug. Who starts embracing you and you haven't had a chance to clean yourself up. He doesn't heal you from a distance. He actually, 2,000 years ago, assumed our fallen flesh. He assumed our sin. He assumed our shame. He assumed our guilt and condemnation. And as he descended and exalted in his body, we have exalted with Christ. He has elevated humanity. And it is only by believing in faith that we enter into an already finished covenant. You have a healer. There's healing in his body. There's healing in the blood. And this assumption... Him assuming our sin and giving us his healing. This took place in the darkest of places. And to the place of sin and our participation in it. And on the cross, Jesus said his wedding vows to you. His wedding vows was, Father, forgive him. His wedding vows was, it is finished. And Jesus is wearing his wedding wedding ring. His wedding ring are the holes and the scars that he wears. Our vows to him are confession and belief. Our wedding ring to Jesus is our baptism. And the weekly renewal of our wedding vows is communion. Even if divorce runs in the family, generational sin... If you've been divorced, you have a bridegroom that is faithful to you. You are his bride. Jesus has already said his I do to you. And through faith we say I do to him. Worship team, you can come on up. There's a reason Satan is just after marriage. It symbolizes God. It symbolizes divine and human union. Satan knew he could not hurt God directly, so he went after the very object of God's love, which 
was his kids. Tempting them. There's a reason God is so for marriage and Satan is so against it. And whether you are happily married, whether you are struggling, whether you are on the brink of divorce, whether you have been divorced, whether that has happened multiple times, you have the bridegroom saying, I love you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And my dear brothers and sisters, we are not the people that bring change to people's lives. We escort them and walk alongside them to the one that changes lives. Wherever we're at, we all need to experience it and be refreshed by the redemption, the healing of the Lord this morning. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna sing a song, and this is your time to grab the elements of communion. And when you come back to your seat, um, Brother Jim is gonna come up here, and he's just going to lead us in communion and pray for God's favor, for God's miraculous power, for God's grace and blessing to rest upon marriages and for those who have been affected by divorce. Because we have, we have the same healer. And this morning we're going ham. So let's grab the elements and come back and let's take communion together.
So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange. cross I will ever be true it shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it some. Change it someday for a crown. Maybe I can just help. Yep. That's for Joey. first group, there are those who are contemplating or are living in active sin right now, or in rebellion and have not received the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you know, it says in the Word that today is the day of salvation. No matter what's gone on before, when we take these elements together this morning, this is a time when you can just say, it stops. It stops. And that you have forgiveness. There's those, as Pastor Joey was sharing, that have been hurt, whose hearts have been broken or are being broken. And as we take the bread together this morning, there is healing. And there is a very small group, but there are some that it amazes me when I, when I hear them share that they go, I don't know what you're talking about. And as you take the bread, thank God that Jesus Christ bore your pain, your hurt, so that you never had to experience it and make it a time of thanksgiving. So I see the, the bread this morning as doing three things. Bringing salvation to those who are lost. And you know, it all starts with the heart. I am totally amazed that Daniel, it said, was a handsome young man who was offered the luxuries of Babylon, and he turned them down, and he said no. But where did it first begin? He said, I'm going to purpose in my heart to stand true and faithful to the true God. And for all of us, that's where it begins. And there are many seasons in our marriages. And as we go through each season, there is opportunity to go and to want to taste the luxuries of the world. But as it says in Proverbs, that has a bitter aftertaste. So may all of us purpose in our heart, no matter what stage we're in, to be true to Him and let Him rule in our hearts. And when Jesus 
had broken the bread. He gave it to them, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. cup that we hold. Jesus said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And we're to do it in remembrance of him. And a few years back, after being a Christian for many years, I don't know how it happened, but somehow the Spirit revealed to me that drinking this cup, remembering that Jesus shed his blood for me, was one of the first times I experienced the guilt of my type A personality being taken away. So no matter where you were in the message that God gave to you through Pastor Joey this morning, by drinking this cup, receiving the blood of Jesus Christ, ask the Holy Spirit, this was amazing. I asked the Holy Spirit if it was true to take away the guilt of my sin. Whether you're just being born into the kingdom this morning, whether you've been a believer for a long time, whatever point you are in in your life, I think at one time we all kind of feel guilty for something we've done. Jesus paid for it. By his body, he has healed the brokenness of our hearts. And by his blood, he has removed the guilt of our sin. Take and drink. I chose to read out of Mark this morning because I like the last verse in this section. If we have taken to heart the message that God placed in Pastor Joey's heart, if we have taken to heart the remembrance we have of what he did on the cross, it's amazing. They didn't sit around and weep and were sorrowful and beat their chests and cut themselves. What the disciples did, they sang a hymn. And we're going to sing a hymn. And it says, after singing a hymn, they went out and they went out to the Mount of Olives. But they didn't go alone, did they? They went with the Lord. So as we go out this week into the world, he goes with you, he loves you, he wants to be your healer, and he's forgiven you. You are free from the guilt of your sin. Do I hear an amen? amen. Well, then let's sing about it. Not yet. Whoa, there we are. Not quite yet, because uh, uh, Christy's got a real quick announcement. Good morning, church. I just wanted to remind you that after church today, we're going to celebrate Joey and Angie and their new, soon-to-be new arrival. So um, join us in the fellowship hall. We have some cake. I will also have a clipboard if you want to sign up to bless them with a meal. Find me. And before we wrap up with our final song, we wanted to ask them to come forward so we can pray for them and just pray for the safe arrival of baby Spolstra and just uh, that Angie has the stamina to make it the finish line. Jim, will you join us up here, Jim? Thank you. I had to apologize to Angie this morning because I've been praying all week she didn't have the baby yet. <laughs> <laughs> because I knew that the shepherd of our flock had a message from God. And in the way he was going to deliver it. And I said, Lord, we have got to hear that. So would you please give Angie a really uh, blessed from the curse delivery of the baby this coming week. <laughs> so although I asked her to bear this a little longer, we have asked also for the Lord to, to bless you in the, in the bringing forth of a new child. So let's pray for... Uh, Joey's family, Pastor Joey's family, and um, just give him glory and thanks. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the message that we heard this morning. 
And we thank you that you have told us that if a man tries to build his house on his own strength, he does it in vain. So we thank you that you are teaching Pastor Joey how to be the spiritual head of his house, how to love his wife, how to receive her as the perfect gift from you as his helpmate. Thank you, Father, that as we get to know them and as we get to see the submissive spirit that Angie has to allow Pastor Joey to be the spiritual head of the family, the fruit will come. We thank you for the love that you have given to them for each other. We ask your protection upon it. We pray the three chords, because three chords are stronger than one, of love, acceptance, and forgiveness. And may those chords become ever stronger through the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray for Jamie and Briar. We pray for the new baby. We pray that the children will be filled with excitement and joy of a new child coming into the family. We pray that there will be sounds of laughter, sounds of joy, sounds of encouragement, sounds of blessings when the children play together. Those sounds will permeate the walls of their house. Father, we thank you for your protection upon them because we know that the evil one wants to destroy the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives and in their house. And so we ask for your protection. Because greater is he, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is in Angie and Pastor Joey, than he that's in the world. May those fiery darts just bounce off. May they not penetrate their house. May you protect them. And now, may you wrap your three cords of strength around the entire family, the five of them, with the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, that we might rejoice with them in the blessings of this new child that you have knit for the glory of your Son. May all five of them find their names written in the Lamb's book of life. We give you glory and praise what you're doing in them and through them. In Yeshua, your perfect and precious name, amen. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown and exchange it someday for a crown Amen Have a good week everybody